rise up as we pray. Once again, Lord, we thank you for the privilege you have given us to be in your presence, to hear your word, and to prepare for the final day. We're asking, Lord, that at this time you give us the heart of the wise, that we'll be wise unto life eternal in Jesus' name. The things that cloud our view, the things that obstruct our way, and the things that deaden our hearts, our spirits, our conscience, that will not think of the coming day, that eternal day. We we'll pray you take those things away from every one of us in Jesus' name. You've been good to us, you've been kind to us, to so show us the things that are coming. And we pray, Lord, we'll have the proper, the right, expected response to your love, to your goodness, to your favor in our lives in Jesus' name. You speak to us as father to children. We will respond like children to the father. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come to consider an important subject. All subjects in the Bible are important. But when you think about the coming day, the final day, the day of reckoning, the day of recompense the day of rewards the day when everything we've ever done on earth will be examined and rewarded it's a very serious situation to think about and the lord will be looking at our faithfulness or unfaithfulness on that day and these are days and times we can make correction, put things right, see where things have not matched up to the expectation of the Lord in preparation for the final day. And make amends. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter of life the whole matter of worship the whole matter of our existence here on earth and the whole matter at the conclusion of all things fear God Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work, every act, every responsibility, everything we have done into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's a final reckoning day coming. God will bring everything into judgment. That's the reason why you want to think of that coming day and get yourself prepared. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must, underline the word must, for we must all appear before the judgment seat 
of Christ. There are those who are quick to tell us the Greek word for the judgment seat. And they try to palliate. They try to soothe. They try to smooth in the context as well as the revelation in verses 10 and 11. But set all the Greek aside. Look at the word. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. That he is all the things we have done here in life. While we were still in the body. It says everything will be examined. And this will not be a private examination. It will not be a private reckoning. It will not be a private kind of judgment. It says that everyone may receive. The things done in the body according to that he has done. God will not judge you for what others have done. What others have left undone. It's going to bring you to that final day, that final reckoning day. And it's going to find out what you in particular, what you have done. What you've done with his only begotten son. What you have done with the word you have heard. What you have done with the responsibility he laid upon your shoulders. What you have done with your life in totality. And it says whether it be good or whether it be bad. Then it says in verse 11. On the basis of verse 10, knowing therefore. That word therefore means because of verse 10. Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And because God will bring every secret thing into the open. And he will judge. It says therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord. Does he use... Um, the Greek knowledge to kind of water down verse 10. They should read verse 11. Because it says, because of this, the terror of the Lord will come upon the people that are found wanting. Then it goes on to say, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also we're made manifest in your consciences the lord wants us to think about the final reward the final recompense for faithfulness or unfaithfulness luke chapter 16 reading from verse 10 luke chapter 16 verse 10 he that is faithful in that which is least. He that is faithful in that which is the smallest. He that is faithful in that which appears negligible of no consequence is faithful also in much. And he that is unfaithful in that which is least unfaithful in that which is very small in that which is passed to him of no consequence that's what people generally say this is so small why should anybody bother about this this kind of unfaithfulness in this matter we can overlook this because this one matters not. And if you talk to yourself like that, any little flaw in your life, any little kind of missing the mark in your life, you always tell yourself, this doesn't matter. I can overlook this. 
in the life of any other one and if i can overlook it then god must be able to overlook this this is not so serious after all but jesus said he that is unfaithful in that which is least is unjust also in much if therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon that's talking about money if you have not been faithful in money if you have not been faithful in material things if you have not been faithful in external responsibilities that you are told to manage then he says who will commit to your trust the true riches and if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's the people because of the selfish nature the self-centered nature that has not been cleansed that has not been crucified that has not been crushed out of their lives they think about life in and out themselves that is to say what have i got in that what's my benefit in that what's my profit in that what's going to come to me from that and if there's nothing coming to them in any of those things they say i get nothing out of it and since i get nothing out of it i might as well do a shoddy work something that is not acceptable because it belongs to another man it's not my deal it's their deal and it says if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's what belongs to another who shall give you that which is your own he expects us to be faithful and you see in the world in which we live today in the world at large and in the church world there's a lot of unfaithfulness psalm 12 reading from verse 1 psalm 12 reading from verse 1 here lord help lord for the godly man ceases for the faithful fail from among the children of men very difficult today to find faithful people trustworthy people dependable people people you can trust and you can close your eyes once you've given them the word of the lord you can be far apart physically you are here they are over there far away if they were faithful they would obey the word keep to the word because they know christ is there with them i will never leave you i'll never forsake you god is there with them my eyes are watching over you the holy spirit is there he will never leave you and because they know the father the son the holy spirit they know god the godhead is there with them they'll be faithful but most people most people do not think of the presence of god they do not think that God is a silent listener to every conversation. They do not think that God is a quiet observer of any action, every action. And because of that, all over the world, in families, there's unfaithfulness. In the offices, there is unfaithfulness. In the ministry, there is unfaithfulness. In the church, the professors of religion, those who profess religion, there is unfaithfulness. Even when we are face to face together, the heart is thinking something else. The mouth is saying another thing. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful for fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity everyone with his neighbor with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak a double heart on the one hand 
they know what the truth is. On the other hand, they say what is not the truth. Live double lives. They speak with the two sides of the mouth. And they go in two different directions. Verse 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering leaves and the tongue that speaketh proud things who have said with our tongue we will prevail. Those are the people that are not faithful. With our tongue we will prevail. Or maybe with our head we will prevail. With our knowledge we will prevail. With our understanding of history we know how all those people were read about in literature, how they did it, we will prevail. With our hands, we will prevail. With our training, our expertise, we will prevail. With our politics, religious politics, we will prevail. Our leaves are our own. Who is Lord? over us such people do not think of eternity they only think of the here and now they're not thinking of the reckoning day the day of recompense or the day of rewards in revelation chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 10 the lord expects us as we look forward to that day coming that we will be faithful. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Have you ever thought about this? Why people compromise? They fear what they will suffer. Whether it's in the office, in the home, in the church, in the community, those who know the right thing to do, the right thing to say, and they know the word of God that they have learned or they have read on their own. The word of God is not difficult. It's written in black and white. And we know what he expects of us. And the people who compromise, the people who say, if I do that, if I live like that, what will so and so do? What will such and such say? Do you see why people backslide? Because of the fear of man. Because of the fear of pain. Because of the love of pleasure. We tend towards pleasure and we try to run away from pain. But the Lord Jesus is saying, your faithfulness is very important as you are moving on to the closing time, as you are moving on to the closing day, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil through people shall cast some of you into prison, confinement, whatever that persecution is, that's what it means at last, that she may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation, trouble, trial, temptation, 10 days. Just 10 days, the word 10 is uh, there for you to understand. As a compa compare 10 to 365, says it's not much after all. As you compare 10 days to all the days of your life, the days of 70 or 80 years, it's not much after all. The suffering will not be long. Be thou faithful unto death. Be thou faithful unto the final day on earth. And I will give thee a crown of life. He wants faithfulness. He expects faithfulness from everyone. Be faithful until death, until your final day here on earth. And then you'll have the crown of life, the crown of life. Revelation chapter 21. Reading from verse 1. And I saw 
a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, the sky, the planets, the earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. Then he tells us in verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes in that coming day. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these things, these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh, that's the faithful one. The one that says, all that matters to me is my loyalty to Christ. All that matters to me is to have his well done on that final day. Those are the overcomers. The people that say pain or persecution, difficulties or crisis, challenges or whatever might come, all that matters is obeying Christ. All that matters is loyalty to the Lord. Those are the overcomers. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But, it's not going to talk of the unfaithful. And you see the reason why the unfaithful is right there. But the fearful, the timid, the coward, the one that's running away from the consequence of righteousness, the one that is dodging the responsibility of being holy, the one that is so fearful, they don't think about eternity. All they think about is people around them. All they think about is that man. I want to be holy, but that man is watching me. What's he going to say about it? I want to be righteous, but look at this woman. That woman is not in agreement. I will suffer. And because of that consideration of the present and of the people around them, they cannot take a stand for Christ, for the word, and for righteousness. Because of that, they are fearful. And for the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the armongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake with bonnets, with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. As you read uh, that verse, you think about those who are not living their own lives, they're living for other people. Think about that. A slave is not living for himself. A slave is, li is living for a master. The fearful one is not living for himself. He's living for the people he fears. I know this is right. I know this is the way. But if I follow the right way, that will be my own decision. That's what I like to do. But I fear the people that will... Punish me for living the right way. And so they live for other people. The sorcerer is not living for himself or for herself. I want to come out of that witchcraft. But I'm afraid 
if I come out, what the other sorcerers will do, what they will say, he is not there because he wants to be there. He is there because he's living for all the people. The Omonga, the adulteress, the adulterer, is not living for himself herself. He's living for the other fellow. This uh, man says, if I come out of this relationship, he's going to blow it up. He's going to expose me. And uh, so, I'm going to live the way he wants. Are you living for yourself? Are you living for people that are putting the pressure on you and they make you unfaithful? There are people who tell lies not because they want to. They lie for other people. The boss has said, feel this in here. Sir, looks like this is not correct. I said, feel it if you want your job. If you want to keep your job, feel it. Your conscience then is sold to that man. You tell a lie for him, not for yourself. And you live a life like that, that's how they want you to live. That's how they want you to act. That's the direction they want you to go. The people who don't have the courage, the stamina, the backbone to live for themselves, the living for other people is because what will they say? What will they do? How will they act? What punishment will they give me? And what pressure will they pile on me if I don't do that? That makes you unfaithful. You're not thinking about your eternal destiny. You're only thinking of the here and the now. And the Lord is saying, a final day is coming. When all those people you have been living for, they will not support you on that day or defend you on that day. Every person will appear before the Lord himself. Verse 27. In verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into, in, into it any that defileth Anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination, or whatsoever maketh a lie, but they which are written in the book, in the Lamb's book of life. We're looking at earthly and eternal rewards of faithfulness. There are three things we're going to quickly consider. Number one, expected response to his faithfulness god is faithful and since god is faithful he's been faithful to us he's been faithful to you he said he will save he has saved you he will heal he has healed you he will deliver he has delivered you he will bless he has blessed you he will answer your prayer he has answered your prayer he has even done many things for us that we have not even prayed for. He has been faithful. What is the expected response to his faithfulness? Number two, exemplary records of for our, faithful, for our faithfulness. Exemplary records of the people that are recorded in scripture. They face the same challenges we face, but they were faithful. And those are examples for you and for me that if they could be faithful in their circumstances, I can be faithful today. You can be faithful today. Exemplary records for our faithfulness. Number three, eternal rewards for the faithful. Eternal rewards for the faithful. Number one, expected response to his faithfulness expected response to his faithfulness deuteronomy chapter 7 reading from verse 9 deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 know therefore that the lord thy god he is god the faithful god he is faithful he fulfills his word he fulfills his promise. Whatever he says he will do, he has done. And he has satisfied us in every way beyond 
our expectation, a faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. What's the response he expects of you because of his faithfulness to you? It's right there, them that love him. Even if, uh, you know, you're dealing with a neighbor, a friend, a younger one, an older one here in life, and it's always faithful, always faithful, always faithful. You love him. That's the right response. That's the proper response. That's the expected response. And because God has always been faithful, our response is we love him and keep his commandments. And we keep that commandment in this generation. And we hand it over to the next generation. And we say, God is faithful. And because God has been faithful to me, and then to members of the family, you pass that on to your children. That's how we love him. That's how we serve him. That's how we worship him. That's why we obey him. That's why we follow him in all things. And that's why we're so committed and consecrated unto him. That's the proper expected response to the faithfulness of God. And repairs them, verse 10, that hate him to their face. To destroy them, he will not be slack. To slack to him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. They shall, thou shalt therefore keep the commandments of the Lord. That he should be faithful to you. A faithful God, a loving God, a kind God, a merciful God, a compassionate God. It says, therefore. As a result of his faithfulness to you, you shouldn't think of any moment you will be disloyal. Any moment you will be unfaithful. Any moment you will be disobedient. You will keep his commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Psalm 36. Reading from verse 5, Psalm 36, reading from verse 5. The response the believer ought to have to the faithfulness of God, to the goodness of God, to the love of God, and to the many blessings he showers upon us. We shouldn't just be saying, Lord, give me, give me, give me. And then we're not responding to what he has done already. Psalm 36, verse 5. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. Thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. It's so high, it's so great, it's unfathomable, immeasurable. In verse 6, thy righteousness is like a great, like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. What's her, faith, what's her response to his faithfulness? Therefore, the children of men, those who are thoughtful, those who think about the faithfulness of God, they put their trust in him. They believe him. They take every word that he said, that he has said, as verity, as truth, and as something to rely upon. That's your response to the faithfulness of God. If you are thoughtful, 
He is faithful. He is trustworthy. You can lean on him. You can rely on him. And because of that, you put your trust. You put your faith completely on him. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasure. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. You're not looking for light in any other place. You're not looking for revelation in any other place. You're not saying, well, God has said this, but hold on, God. Let me check off from here, check off from there, check off from there, and see which one to take. In thy light we shall see light. We come to him as a final authority. His revelation is final. His word is final. His commandments are final. Anything he says, that's it. He has revealed this. This is the way. Walk ye therein. And we say, yes, Lord, we know he is faithful. We can trust him. Verse 10. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. A response to his faithfulness is that we are upright in heart. Micah chapter 6. In Micah chapter 6, we're reading from verse 3. The Lord is reminding us he's been faithful. He's done beyond all that he ever promised. He's not uh, come short at all in everything that he said he will do. And he challenged the people of Israel. He said, how are you responding to my love? How are you responding to my faithfulness? How are you responding to my goodness unto you? He said in Micah chapter 6 verse 3, Oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? Wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. What have I promised? That have not done testify against me what do you need that have not supplied testify against me what have you requested that have not sacrificed my only begotten son to give unto you testify against me for i brought thee up out of the land of egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember. It says, do you recollect at all what I've done for you? Do you recollect what happened in Egypt? Do you recollect my deliverance? Do you recollect what happened in the wilderness too? All the things that I did. He said, if you remember, if you recollect, you will be faithful. What's he expecting? You are saying, okay, God, what do we do? What do you want? You are faithful. You are wonderful. You are nice. What's our response? What are you expecting from us? They said in verse 6, where we shall I come before the Lord? About myself before the high God shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves of a year old is that what he's waiting for in verse 8 he has showed thee O man he has revealed that to you how to respond to his faithfulness he has showed thee O man he has taught you O man what is good? And what does the Lord require of thee? To do justly. That's how to respond. See what I've done. I've been just unto you. Pick that up and be just to. To do justly and to love mercy. I've been merciful unto you. Show mercy as well. And to walk humbly with thy God. It says that 
is what he expects. That's how he expects you will react, you will respond to what he has done. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. He told the children of Israel in the Old Testament, see what I have done and see what I expect from you. The response you ought to have demonstrated. And as you think about yourself, you're saying, how does he want you to respond to his goodness? His love? His faithfulness? His answering your prayer? Is saving your soul. In giving you all the privileges in life. He has given you. According to his faithfulness. What's the response is asking demanding from you. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. In Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness? Are you despising the riches of his goodness? and forbearance and long-suffering not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance that's why he's doing all that sometimes there are people who say why do good things happen to bad people why do good things happen to bad people why does God show favor to bad people why does God ever have mercy on sinners why does he bless them the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance the Lord is expecting that as you know how bad you are how sinful you have been and now he touched your life he provided for you he healed you he answered your prayer it is not for you to say uh-huh you see now it doesn't really matter whether somebody is a sinner or not because god will always do good that's not the purpose the purpose is that the goodness of god goodness on meritage favor on meritage Miracle unmerited will lead you to repentance. That's the response you ought to have instead of making an excuse and saying, okay, I'm bad, but you know, God is always good. It says, because of that, repent. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there has no temptation taking you but such as is common to man it's talking about temptation here when the devil comes to tempt to lure to entice to draw you into evil into sin into disobeying god into going the wrong direction temptation but it says over here, whatever temptation has come to you, is common to man. It happens everywhere. Enticement to evil. Enticement to sinning. It's not special. It comes to everyone. Even Christ, our Lord, was tempted. But he was victorious. And when the temptation comes, what are you to think about? Look at verse 13. It says, but God is faithful. It says, when temptation comes, don't think about yourself first. My flesh will get pleasure out of this. The self-centeredness. This other person will get pleasure out of this. That's man-centeredness. What do you think about? Temptation has come. God is faithful faithful see what he has done for me see what he has provided for me see how good god has been to even keep me alive until this time you think about the faithfulness of god not only that you think about his faithfulness who will not suffer you allow you permit you to be tempted above that ye are 
able. You're thinking about God. You say, God is wonderful. With my big stature, with my big understanding, with my great opportunities, look at this little thing that is coming my way. I have no reason not to overcome this one. Because God is so faithful, he has not allowed me to be tempted above that which I am able. This one is under my control. This one, I can say no. This one, I can reject. If I am thinking about the faithfulness of God, I will overcome. It's when I lose sight of the faithfulness of God. And I begin to think about myself. What I gain out of this. But he says, but even with the temptation also will make a way of escape. I have no excuse. You have no excuse. He is so faithful that in all those temptations, he makes a way of escape that ye may be able. He's not interested in your fall. He's not waiting somewhere for, to watch you and see that you're fallen. And then he comes and says, Aha, you've done it. I'm going to do this. That's not his intention. His intention is that you'll overcome every time. What's the consequence? Was the response? Was the Lord demanding of us because of his faithfulness? Look at verse 14. Wherefore, because of that, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from anything and everything that makes an idol of you, that makes an idol of your flesh, that makes an idol of money that makes an idol of what you might gain don't think of yourself think of god the supreme one first corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 first corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 let a man so account of us as of the ministers of christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It's required in stewards, in ministers, in those who are called the servants of God and the children of God that a man a woman be found faithful so that any time whenever he will come he'll find you faithful first Thessalonians chapter 5 first Thessalonians chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 15 the expected response to his faithfulness First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 15. You might want to look at verse 24 first. Faithful is he. Faithful is he. Faithful is our God. The one who has called you who also will do it. What's our response to that faithfulness of God? Verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Don't look at them. Don't look at man. Look at God. God is faithful. He's the one that has commanded you to do right. Make him your focus. Center your attention on him. Don't center your attention on evil doers. They've done evil. I will do evil. No, that's not faithfulness to God. They're going to disrespect, disregard, disobey God because of what man has done. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. Whatever people around you say or do, ever follow that which is good. That's your response to the faithfulness of God, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Why are you rejoicing? I'm being persecuted. How can I rejoice? Don't look at persecutors. Look at the faithfulness of God. God 
is faithful. And in every persecution, for every persecution is going to reward you in eternity. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. When your strength is failing you, go back to God. Look at the faithfulness of God. And your response to the faithfulness of God is prayer. You lean on him. You rest in him. You trust him. You are making your request known unto him. I need strength. I don't want to fail you. I need power. I need backbone. I don't want to compromise. Pray without ceasing in everything, not in some things, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you see here the center of our lives, the focus of our life is God. He is a faithful one. And you are not thinking about what people are doing, what people are not doing. Quench not the spirit. The faithfulness of God has sent the spirit unto you to alert you, to wake you up, to stir you up, and to reveal himself more and more unto you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Why? Because God is faithful. And because God has done so much for you and has given so much to you. You say, even the things that appear to be evil, I abstain from them. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He will do it. Because he is faithful. That's why you trust him. That's why you lean on him. That's why you believe him. That's why you make your request before him. Point number two. Exemplary records of for our faithfulness. Exemplary records for our faithfulness. The history of men of God, women of God in the Bible, they reach in to encourage us. They're reaching to alert us to say, see him, see her, just like you. He was faithful. He responded well. And he lived a life that was rewardable. If he could, you can. If she could do that in faithfulness to God, in response to God, you can. That's why those things are recorded. Romans chapter 15, reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were reaching aforetime, were reaching for our learning. The records of people in Bible days, reaching for our learning. That we, through patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. The hope you have is, God helped them. He will help me. They stood just a short time. We can stand the short time we have to live here on earth in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. They are reaching for us all these. Let's have some records, some examples of the people that were devoted to God, obedient to God, yielded unto God, consecrated unto God, these people that remained with the Lord till their final day 
in Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1. It says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock, whence ye are hewn, and to the whole of the beach, whence ye are dig. Look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah, that bear you, for I called him alone. I called him alone. I called him alone. And blessed him and increased him. As you look at the life of Abraham, it says, if you cannot endure taking a stand alone, if you cannot endure living in righteousness alone, you always need to be supported, encouraged, motivated. You need a helping hand every time. Motivation every time. Somebody to come by your side every time. And somebody to even flatter you a little bit. Encourage you a little bit. Cajole a little bit before you can do a little right thing. Don't these people know we need encouragement and support and we need motivation? I say they just give us the Bible and that is it. Go and obey. It says, look at Abraham. I called him alone. I gave him commandments I never gave to any other person. Take that child, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and sacrifice him to me upon the mountain which i will show you and i leave the following money arose and took isaac i called him alone and he obeyed what an example he has not demanded so much like that from you all this requesting is that you must be born again live a righteous life and the righteous life is shown very clearly on the pages of scripture. A life above reproach, in the public, in the private. And even when you are alone, I called him alone. He obeyed me because of that I blessed him and I increased him. Would you then make up your mind today? That's whether people are there to motivate or not, encourage or not, support or not, reward you or not. It's called you alone. You fix your mind, you fix your eyes on the Lord. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Sometimes you ask a fellow and you say, hey, come on here. I don't see you anymore. You're no more in the service of the Lord. Pastor, no encouragement, no support. We do everything. There's no appreciation. Nobody ever said, wonderful, well done. What's your name? I'm going to write that down. I'll remember you when the rainy day comes. I'm going to do something. Nobody ever said that. That's why I just felt alone, 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 faithfulness, faithfulness. You are saved, you are sanctified, you are holy, you are obeying the Lord, you are serving the Lord. Nobody ever said, well done. I called him alone. You obeyed me alone. Your mind is on God, not on man. Your desires are towards God, not towards man. Your reward will come from God, not from man. There are some people, they don't show they are Christians, but they can only do something good when you are watching them. When somebody is there to say, what well, I knew 
you are up to that. I knew you will do that. And then they feel high. This is great. What I love in that preacher is he always encourages us. That's what you are waiting for before you do good. Your mind is not on God. Center your mind on God. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, brethren are supposed to be holy. Wherefore, holy brethren were supposed to be saintly. Holy brethren were supposed to have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holy brethren were not supposed to be sinning brethren. Defiled brethren. Unrighteous brethren. We're not supposed to be compromising brethren. We're supposed to be brethren that have backbone to our conviction. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him. Who was faithful to him. We don't know that Jesus Christ... Our Lord had to be alone in Gethsemane all alone. Thy will be done carrying the cross. Where was Peter? Where was John? Where was James? What if Jesus depended upon the motivation, the encouragement of Peter, James, and John? What if uh, Jesus was looking at Peter? Peter, I need you. I need you. I need you. This is going to be a rough road. And you told me, you'll never deny me. You'll never, you'll never forsake me. Peter, I'm counting on you so that I can remain faithful to my calling. No. Peter disappointed him. But Christ remained faithful. In Gethsemane, he prayed all alone. On the road, on the way to Calvary, he carried the cross all alone. On the cross, there he hung. When he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All alone, in faithfulness unto God. The record of scripture were given is that even if you have nobody to lean on, even if you have nobody to support you, if you were the only person in that office, the only person in that village, the only person in that community, and you see that God calls you to be righteous, He calls you to be holy, He calls you to take the standard of the gospel and lift it up by the life you live. As the only person there, you say, I am going to stand. You will stand. I said you will stand. Who was faithful to him that appointed him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. He brings in Moses now. Moses too had to stand alone. You know. If the Lord is only going to test your faithfulness, the time will come when, you know, you will not have the encouragement of Aaron, the encouragement of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the encouragement of Miriam, the encouragement of everybody around. Moses, you are doing a great job. Keep on firing on. Moses, you are doing a great job. Keep on leading us. You are going to have even the whole of the tribe of Israel that will say, what is the land going with milk and honey? And then they took up stones. They wanted to stone him. And Moses remained faithful in all his house. For you to understand that what God is looking for is that he has given us these records so that you're not always looking at somebody's face. You're not looking at somebody's stature, somebody's support. Are you supporting me? Are you helping me? Are you holding me up? I hope you're praying for me. Without your prayer, I cannot stand. I hope you're praying for me. Without your prayer, the heat is too much. I cannot obey God. Huh? Is that so? Their prayer is greater than Calvary. Their prayer is greater than the intercession of Christ for you. 
their prayer is greater than what God has done for you. He's giving you the whole Bible. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. Without your prayer, I cannot make it. I hope you are praying for me. I hope you are praying for me. If I fail, it's you that made me fail. I'm looking up to you. What? I thought we're looking up to God. I thought my grace is sufficient for you. I thought God is still on the throne. I thought he will uphold his saints. He will keep the feet of his saints. Is that not blasphemy? When you set aside Christ, set aside Calvary, set aside the word of God, set aside the Holy Spirit, and it is this brother, it is this sister, I'm looking up to you. You're my God. I'm looking up to you. You're my support. I'm looking up to you. I cannot obey God without you. I easily get discouraged. Christ is not sufficient. Ah, that's blasphemy. Look up to God. He says, I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. And when you put your trust absolutely in the Lord, your confidence absolutely in the Lord, and you fix your eyes, you fix your face like a flint, and you're going in that direction the Lord has for you, that he wants you to obey him, then you say, Lord, I know you are my sufficiency. It'll be your sufficiency. Are you there? I said, it'll be your sufficiency. It will never leave you. It will never forsake you. It will see you through to the end in Jesus' name. Look at verse 5. And Moses very truly was faithful in all his house. There are some people that will not come into the ministry. The Lord is calling them, pick up the touch of the gospel. Go preach the gospel. And they are thinking, I've heard a lot of stories about challenges that preachers face. I've heard a lot of stories about the difficulties that the families of ministers face. <laughs> if I'm going to do that, give me time. Give me time. I need intercessors. I want to get women who can pray, men who can pray. If I have assurance of, even if it's only 12, they will pray for me day and night, day and night then I will give in to the call of God upon my life. The one who has called you is not sufficient. The one who is calling you to the ministry is not sufficient. You need all those people. Once they are there, I can breathe. I can stand. I can walk. Once they are there. If they are not there, I am gone. And we read a lot of these stories in missionary reports. So and so made it, not because of Christ on the throne. So and so was successful in the missionary work, not because of the veracity of God's word. So and so made it successfully in ministry, not because of the faithfulness of God. To his calling, but because intercessors, intercessors, intercessors are good if we don't make a God out of them. But all alone, you can stand. You will stand. And sometimes, you know, some people, when they see me, Pastor, are you praying for me? What if I told you? And I said, honestly, I didn't even remember your name for the last one year. Ah, you crumble. I'm gone. Because pastor has not remembered your name for the past one year. Christ is impotent. God is powerless. The Holy Spirit is nowhere to be found. The promises of God are not yes and amen. But if the pastor said, what do you expect? 
you are the only one on earth. I remember I pray for you every day. Praise the Lord. Then I can leave. No, we're not praising the Lord because you dishonor the Lord. Change your focus. Look up to God. The one who has called you, look unto me, all ye the ends of the earth, and be ye saved. For I am God, and there is none else. Our God is sufficient. Give me a good amen. amen. Whether they are praying for you or they are not praying for you, Jesus is interceding for you and is praying for you. He has given you the word. He has given you the Holy Ghost. You will stand. Am I talking about somebody there? You will stand in Jesus' name. And Moses, verily, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken after. And you see right there how God lifted up those people that stood alone. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 4. Daniel 6 verse 4. Here's the word concerning Daniel. Exemplary records for our faithfulness. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion, no fault. For as much as he was, was that word there? I said, was the word there? For as much as he was faithful, and neither was there any error or fault found in him. Didn't this man Daniel stand alone? Of course. No father there, no mother there, no preacher, pastor there, no minister, counselor there, even Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Are not found in this chapter when they signed the edict. What is Shadrach? They have signed an edict. Meshach, where are you? They have signed an edict. Abednego, are you there? There's the time to pray for me. If you don't pray for me, I'm gone. Not Daniel. They said, if anybody prayed, search the face of the Lord. All these 30 days, he'll be thrown into a lion's den. He went to his house, opened the windows, faced Jerusalem, and he prayed three times as he did a fourth time, standing all alone. They threw him in the lion's den, all alone. He came out of that lion's den all alone. We can do it alone. We can take a stand alone. You are the only Christian in that office. You can stand. The only Christian in that family. You can stand. And the only believer in that community. You can stand. You will not cringe. You will not fall. You will not compromise in Jesus name. That's the faithfulness he expects from us. Point number three. Eternal rewards. For the faithful eternal rewards for the faithful we're looking at matthew chapter 24 matthew chapter 24 reading from verse 45 matthew 24 verse 45 and this is how to get ready for the coming of the Lord. The unfaithful will not be ready. The cowards will not be ready. The people who are easily moved by the winds that blow and the waves that toss them 
in the sea on the ocean of life, they will not be ready. But the people who put God before them, set the Lord before them, and they're looking unto the Lord every time as the author and the finisher of their faith. They're looking at the Lord as the perfect example that he has for them. Those are the people that will be ready in the coming days. We're looking at Matthew chapter 25. I read from verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant. The one who is wise will be faithful. The one who is foolish will be unfaithful. He's not thinking of the consequence of his action. The consequence, eternal consequence of that action that he's taking. If you're wise, you think of the eternal consequence of the action. Do you succumb? Think of the eternal, eternal consequence. Do you fall? Do you fail? Do you collapse? Under the weight of the challenge before you, upon you. Think of the eternal consequence. Or do you stand firm and stand in the Lord and stand with the Lord and stand for the Lord by His grace? You stand if you're thinking of the eternal consequence. Who then, verse 45, is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Obedience must continue until he comes. Whom his Lord shall find so doing when he comes. The prayer life, the consecrated life, the yielded life, the submissive life, the loyal, faithful, obedient, loving life must continue until he comes. What if you become unfaithful? Any consequence? Any recompense was 48. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth is coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink what they drunk in, the Lord of that servant, hear this, the servant belongs to the Lord. But he became unfaithful. In his unfaithfulness, he backslid. He started acting, living, contrary to the word of the Lord and the word of the Master. Some people tell us, once saved, always saved. Once saved, forever saved. Once a child of God, doesn't matter whether you are faithful or you are not faithful. Obedient or not obedient, righteous or unrighteous, saintly or sinful, you are godly or you are ungodly. They say, what does that matter? You are saved, you are saved. That's not true, you know. That's false. That's error. That's false doctrine. Look at verse 50. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour that he is not aware of, see what will happen, and shall cut him asunder. He'll cut him completely forever away from himself. Shall cut him asunder. And appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. That means it's backsliding, it's unfaithful, it's unrighteous, it's ungodly, it's unholy. Forever and ever he will pay the consequence. Chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. To get a well done from the Lord, we need faithfulness. And the Lord is waiting for you to show, for you to demonstrate. You are born again, be faithful. You are sanctified, be faithful. Holiness is the expression of faithfulness in a sanctified child of God. Anything that resembles unholiness, unrighteousness, ungodliness in any shape, in any form, in the privacy of your home, in the privacy of your heart, you reject everything. Say, no, I will be faithful to the one who has called me. And because he has called me, and he is faithful because he has called me, and he's been good to me, I'm going to remain loyal and loving and obedient unto him. The Lord said unto him, Well done, the good and faithful servant that was been faithful in a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into enter thou into the joy of thy lord reward on the final day look at bastardi the one who is so faithful the one who says i'm saved i'm saved i'm a child of god i'm a worker i'm a minister i'm a servant of god and he's not doing what the Lord expects him to do. He forgets the a reckoning day, Bastachi. And cast ye the unprofitable servant, the unfaithful servant, the unrighteous servant, the disloyal servant, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The question is, for how long will that be? Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them, on the left hand, depart from me. Ye cursed into everlasting fire. How long will the fire be? I said, how long will the fire be? How long is hell fire? Tell me out loud. Forever and ever. Cast the unprofitable servant into that lake of fire, everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment those who are unfaithful those who backslide and they remain in that position of backsliding until they die until Christ comes I repent later I repent tomorrow and that day comes oh tomorrow not today again I don't have the tomorrow not today again I'll make it the next retreat and make it the next time. And you keep on pushing it forward. And eventually the Lord comes. That's what the Lord is saying. Watch. So that you'll escape that final judgment. Judgment is coming. Are you faithful? Are you saved? Are you sanctified? Are you righteous? Are you holy? Are you trustworthy? Are you obedient to the Lord? And are you dependable? Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 21. Reading from verse 34. I'll back up to verse 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away. 
but my words shall not pass away. And take heed unto yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with sophiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares, unprepared, not ready. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore. Your sage, don't be careless. Watch ye therefore. Sanctified, don't be negligent. Watch ye therefore. And pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And when you stand before him on that final day, if you have been saved, and you keep saved, sanctified, keep sanctified, faithful, loyal, obedient, dependable, unto him trustworthy, you'll stand with joy. You'll stand in trust and confidence. Your conscience will be clear and clean. You've been waiting for that day. And that day has come for you. It will be a day of rewards, a day of joy, a day of rejoicing, a day of everlasting celebration and jubilation before the Lord. But those who have been unfaithful, the day of reckoning, day of sorrow, day of suffering will begin that day it will be forever and ever make your choice for you what will it be for you where will you be where will you spend eternity let's rise up and pray to the lord that the lord in his grace will help you to think about his faithfulness and to respond appropriately to that and become faithful unto the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. What's it to be faithful? He merits your faithfulness. It's not so much. You're saved. That's of his mercy. Sanctified. That's of his goodness. And you want to respond to that. Love him because of his faithfulness obey him because of his faithfulness trust him because of his faithfulness yield to him because of his faithfulness consecrate entirely completely unto the lord because of his faithfulness The grace to stand alone. Be obedient unto him all alone. Sacrifice. Deny yourself all alone. Look unto Abraham. I called him alone. He was obedient, faithful. Support or no support. All alone. That's what the Lord is calling you to. And if you're saved, you'll have some backbone that can't stand. You're sanctified, you'll have some backbone that can stand. All just looking over your shoulder, somebody there supporting me, somebody there helping me, somebody there encouraging me, somebody there motivating me, somebody there flattering me. 
your stand in your office when the pressure is much when the heat is on you will stand because you put your set the Lord always before you you're not afraid of man afraid of woman because you know your God is greater than them all. The frowns of men matter not unto you. The smiles of men matter not for you. If their smile is to trip you, lead you astray. Make you compromise. All you're interested in is a well done from your Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Persecution loses its pain when you're looking unto God. Suffering loses its pain in your life when you're looking unto God. When you make Him the focus of your life and the focus. Of your faithfulness. You'll soon be going back home. We will not be there with you. Can you stand faithfully, courageously, boldly, graciously, and righteously? Can you stand? Of course you can. Will you stand? That's why you are praying. Help me, Lord. He will help you. Help me, Lord. He will help you. His grace is sufficient unto you. If you have people to support you, wonderful. Nobody to support you'll find the grace of God more than sufficient. His power can hold you up. Like Daniel in Babylon. Your people to encourage you, wonderful. There's nobody to encourage you. The power of God is more than sufficient. You can stand. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is sufficient for you. My strength is sufficient for you. Won't you stand? When those tempters come again, won't you stand? When the temptress comes again, won't you stand? When the storms rage and the waves roar, won't you stand faithful unto the Lord till the very end, until death? You can stand.
if you have hope of being in heaven at last, you must stand. You have to stand. If heaven is your goal, if the crown of life is your goal, you have to stand. Live righteously, godly, soberly, without compromise. You must stand. And really, you are not alone. God is with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. It's always there. Christ is with you. He is more than enough. More than sufficient. I am with you until the end of the world. The Holy Spirit is with you. I will send the Comforter unto you that he may abide with you forever. You have no reason to fail. You have no reason to compromise. The word of God is with you. That word has power to sustain you. The word is in your heart, in your mouth. The word of faith which we preach. Keep on standing and having done all to stand. <laughs>